So let's get started. Uh, again, good evening and welcome. My name is Larry Calbers. I hold the R. Chad Dreyer Chair in Accounting Ethics, and I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Business Administration here at LMU. So the Dreyer Chair in Accounting Ethics Distinguished Speaker Series is one of the many activities of the College of Business Administration's Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability. Before I introduce our speaker, Mr. Rene Levine, let me give you a few guidelines and program format for tonight. So let me just share my screen. So uh, we will have some Q&A, so please type your questions in the Q&A window. The questions will be moderated during and after the presentation. For the most part, I'll leave the questions until after Mr. Levine's made his presentation, but we may uh, ask him a question as he goes to keep him on his toes. You can also use the chat window to post comments that are not questions. And for those of you using CBA Advantage, a QR code will be displayed uh, later in the presentation. We're also gonna have a special Zoom uh, re reception just for students right after the, the presentation takes place, which will allow students to ask Mr. Levine questions face-to-face, uh, -face, at least uh, Zoom version of face-to-face. -face. So we'll put a Zoom link in the chat near the end of the presentation so you can switch over to that. Uh, the webinar is also being recorded and will be available after the presentation, probably in a couple of days on the CBA uh, YouTube channel. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Rene Levine, LMU accounting class of 1983. Mr. Levine is currently the president and chief executive officer of Ironbow Technologies with headquarters in Herndon, Virginia. His career spans three decades of sales, marketing, operations, finance, and accounting experience at organizations such as Aptis, Northrop Grumman IT, Federal Data Corporation, and Ernst & Young. As president and CEO, Rene led the team that once was Aptis Technology Solutions in the spin out from Aptis to become what is now Ironbow Technologies and has been leading the business since 2004. Rene is a certified public accountant and a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. He's been a member of the board of directors of the Technology Council of Maryland since 2002 and most recently served as the board's chairman. He was a founding member and chair of the Prince George's Technology Council and now serves as a member of the board of directors of the Prince George's Community College Foundation and chairman of the board at uh, Doctors Community Hospital. I'm now gonna turn the Zoom controls over to our amazing LMU alumnus and speaker for tonight, Mr. Rene Levine. Welcome, Rene. Well, thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm really appreciate it, and I'm so excited about it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to join you guys this evening. Larry uh, contacted me in the late summer, early fall, and we were trying to put this together, and I had a little speed bump uh, that uh, wouldn't allow for it, and I'm just happy that, uh, that we've got to this point, and we can... Uh, we can share this evening together. Um, I'd much rather be there in person and uh, hugging you up in the room. Um, I really enjoy that, uh, but uh, virtual will have to suffice, of course. This pandemic has everything turned on its ear. Uh, and like everything else, we've, we've adopted as a business. Uh, you guys have adopted as, as a faculty and students and, and others. And you just got to keep moving forward, right? Got to keep putting one foot in front of the next. And we'll get this, get this behind us uh, at some point in time. Now, I'm told we have over 200 uh, attendees. I'll put it that way, 200 attendees. And I don't know to be overwhelmed or underwhelmed, um, but I'm going to say I'm overwhelmed uh, that we have 200 people that are interested in hearing about ethics and integrity on a Wednesday evening. I can just see uh, me and my gang back in, uh, um, back in the 80s uh, saying, hey, what are you doing tonight? And what are you doing tonight? And some of us saying, uh, well, we're gonna attend this, uh, this uh, ethics and integrity class with uh, this uh, older guy um, from, the, from the 50s. Uh, doesn't sound all that thrilling and exciting, but 
I'm hoping to make this interesting for you. Um, with uh, Larry's permission, we're going to put some building blocks around this. So I'm going to start a bit. We thought it would be great for you guys to hear a little bit more about my background, professional career. Uh, then we'll plug in ethics and we're going to talk a little bit about diversity and then perhaps some thoughts for, uh, for the future for you guys and maybe something you can take with you. So that's my mom and uh, my siblings and then some cousins and, and aunts. I'm a native uh, Californian, uh, born, in, born and reared in, uh, in Los Angeles. I uh, currently reside in, in Boca Raton, Florida. So I like the sun. I'm coming to you from Herndon, Virginia, which is a suburb outside of DC, which is where uh, our business is headquartered. Um, very tight-knit family, Catholic, uh, working-class family. I'm the eldest of four and um, always been a bit of a hard charger uh, in that respect. Uh, I'm the, the first in the family, either side, uh, to attend school. And um, we've got some other graduates behind me, but in my, in my immediate family, I'm the only one to, uh, to get a degree. Uh, from a four-year uh, institution. So uh, very special for me and obviously the family as well. So that's my childhood home. And uh, it's um, about 500 square feet or was 500 square feet, two bedrooms and a bath. I know most of you guys are looking at apartments that, that uh, shape up in, in, in that manner. Uh, if you guys are familiar with the geography, so this is in South Central, 110th Street is uh, where we live, uh, just off of Broadway. The house is no longer there, uh, was raised. We did have a very uh, unique treasure there. We had a double lot and the house sat back, so we had a lot of room and we did a lot of stuff outdoors. So in any event, it's only a half an hour from, from campus, but and from a physical perspective, but from an emotional and psychological perspective, I can tell you it was, it was a million miles away. And uh, so any event, I thought that would help you guys a little bit with the grounding. Now, oftentimes uh, I don't start with my college uh, background. I'll start with my high school background. Um, and particularly when I think that there may be some cubs on the line and I, I'd be surprised if there aren't some cubs on the line. Um, Quite frankly, we have Cubs everywhere. So uh, here in the DC uh, metropolitan area, we've got over 200 uh, Loyola High School alum uh, in the area at any given point in time. And uh, for, a new, for a myriad of reasons, but, uh, but it was amazing to me that we had so many here and that we pretty much cross, uh, cross the country. But I start with Loyola because it was a key differentiator uh, in my life and was my bridge to the future. And it really, really kind of put me ahead of the game uh, when I look at my peers from, from elementary school and, and just from the neighborhood and in the surrounding region. I learned early on uh, what it meant to compete. And I showing you a picture of uh, uh, high school basketball, but not just in sports, in everything in life. Um, in the classroom, which is extremely important, work environments, activities, special projects, and what about teamwork, right? And coalescing and collaborating with others. So uh, it, was, it was an indelible uh, mark in, in, in my development and one that I'll never forget. Uh, and so I, I oftentimes lead with that. I feel like when I got to, uh, to LMU, I was thoroughly prepared for it. Uh, in many respects, um, because of the Loyola tradition and the regiment that we go through, uh, I felt very much prepared. Now, you look at uh, YLMU and well, natural connection between, uh, between the high school and, and the university. And at one time, by the way, uh, we shared campuses way back in, in the mid 1860s or the, the latter 18, 1800s. And um, but that's, that's not why, why I selected it. So like any uh, Loyola High student, you have high aspirations and 
So you take a flyer at uh, an Ivy League. Um, some of my classmates take more than a flyer at, at the Ivy League and, and get accepted to many. I was not one, um, but uh, certainly did that. And then I really quite wasn't quite sure what I was going to do for college um, because that decision was, for the most part, left up to me. My parents didn't have experience with it. And the last major decision uh, that they really influenced was that move to, to go to Loyola High School, which in effect was also a million miles away because the schools that were more popular were Sarah, Bourbon Day, Mount Carmel, which no longer exists. But uh, in any event, this decision was mine. So in, in conversation with our guidance counselor and our I remember it like yesterday, uh, Father Prieto, we talked about the options and uh, we talked about local and, and options um, outside of the immediate area. He really influenced me and he said, you know, for the things that you want and the things that you wanna do, uh, you really need to consider Loyola. And as I investigated further, it made complete sense for me. It was about the right size not too big, not too small. I, I was never very interested in going to a 50,000 person school. I wanted something that was much more manageable. And um, coming from uh, 1,200 students at Loyola uh, to what was 4,000 undergrad um, and, and my entry point was a good place to be. Uh, the other thing was affordability. So there wasn't any resources to send me to school. Where could I get the most money to go to school? And I fared uh, very well with scholarships and grants um, through Loyola and, and, and a few other schools as well. Most importantly, we talked about the nurturing environment and that is very, very critical uh, in your college, um, uh, uh, in, uh, college scenario. So as you're thinking about uh, what kind of environment you wanna be in, um, do you want to be a number or do you want to be in a place that you feel connected and that you can make a difference in, in that kind of environment? So, uh, so that was a big check. And then the geography was really important. So it was far enough from home uh, that I felt like I was away. And as I indicated, it was a million miles away psychologically, um, but close enough that if I had to get back, uh, I could get back. And then we realized that uh, going to school away would put an additional burden on me or the family trying to get back and forth and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and it allowed me to work. I, I started a job when I was in high school as a junior and uh, worked throughout college uh, a variety of different shifts. And when I wasn't playing basketball or I got hurt, um, I, was, I was working. So it was a great choice for me for all those reasons. And uh, when I look back on it from a career standpoint, I wouldn't change a thing. So the, uh, the handsome guy to the left with uh, what I would call a trim down afro because um, that wasn't as big as it was at a point in time, um, but was the last time that I actually uh, carried an afro. So that's me uh, in entry to Loyola. And if you can believe it or not, I still have what was our ID card. Now, LMU wasn't too cognizant about cyber uh, security fraud and or stolen identities. I had to Photoshop this because of all things, our student ID number was our social security number. So if you lost that, uh, number one, your social was floating around. Uh, number two, I wasn't gonna put it on the screen and let you guys see it with my, with my social on it. So it's kind of funny when you fast forward, you think about, uh, the security issues that we have and, and me being in the technology space. Over to the right is um, that good looking guy grown up and uh, my youngest son who is uh, 25 now and is an alum. He's, he's a class of 2018. And uh, while I didn't push him, I did try to influence him to major in accounting. He decided he wanted to be a finance man major and so uh, and so he did, and uh, he's doing quite well. So he'll be happy to know that he made the, uh, he made the presentation. So accounting, um, really my path to success. Um, you know, 
I wasn't interested in science and wasn't that interested in engineering. Uh, I knew I wanted to do something in business coming out of high school, but I wasn't sure what. And um, I started to press a few buttons. Uh, number one objective for me was to be employable. I needed to launch my career. I did not have the time or energy uh, to go through four years of school, uh, do what it takes to get the degree, and then be in a position that I needed to search for uh, a job opportunity in my, uh, or, or career opportunity. So I wanted to accelerate that. And uh, back in those days, you really had through your sophomore year to make a decision on uh, what your discipline was going to be. And during the sophomore year, I excelled in, in uh, accounting and I had mentors, um, juniors and, and seniors. I talked to them a lot about um, the differentials between um, you know, the various disciplines in, in the School of Business. And the, the numbers spoke to me. There's a thousand in the School of Business and 50 accounting majors. And so I said, I, I like those numbers. Um, I can differentiate myself there, number one. Number two, if you talk to any accounting major, it's the harder route. It's the longer path, and uh, and now it's essentially a five-year path, right? Going from 120 credits to to 150 credits. So, um, so I put my stake in the ground, uh, and I started navigating as a sophomore as to how I would further differentiate myself. And I would encourage you guys to be thinking about that um, all the time, quite frankly. But I got involved early with the accounting society. Uh, as a sophomore, uh, I then positioned myself to be the junior representative. And then as a senior, I was the chairman of the accounting society. Now, I'm told uh, one of my colleagues may be on the line and uh, we were really good, uh, good buddies and tight, tight buddies, uh, John Yamashita. Uh, he was a vice, he was my vice chair. And um, so we got along very well and both uh, ended up um, leveraging that to a successful career uh, in public accounting. Uh, quite frankly, when interview time came along and we did not have what you guys have with the externships and internships and early visibility, we had to create that for ourselves, uh, which, we, which we did <laughs> in a regular basis, but we positioned ourselves to be at the forefront uh, of the discussion. And so uh, by the time the interview um, season came to fruition, uh, I had multiple opportunities and, and so did John. And I look at accounting. So I talked about uh, science, you know, whether it's medicine or engineering, accounting to me is the anatomy of business. And it's really the foundation uh, for my success. And I use this foundation every single day, uh, even though I haven't been in charge of finance or accounting since 1994, but it's something that st sticks with you. Uh, and I rely upon it quite frankly, uh, on a daily basis. So that accounting platform led to uh, 10 years in public accounting. And um, it, I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world either. It's the best education that you can absolutely get uh, professionally. You have a myriad of uh, client experiences, a great deal of uh, social networking uh, with other uh, achievers. Uh, quite frankly, you build your skill set uh, much more broadly than I think people view accountants and that you may view yourselves, quite frankly. And the exposure is, is tremendous. And so uh, I really cherish those years. And I learned early on every day uh, in an in a accounting setting, and particularly a public accounting setting, was an investment in my future. Now, ultimately, you get to a place where Either you decide you're gonna be a partner or they decide you're gonna be a partner uh, and you might choose to do something different. Although it's different these days in that there could be a career track in public accounting that doesn't center around being a partner. Um, what happened for me was that we had a merger between Ernst & Winnie and Arthur Young, uh, becoming Ernst & Young and the 12 year track to partner uh, suddenly became 14 years. And while um, that wasn't the end of the world, 
uh, it lengthening lengthen the time uh, that I was going to spend uh, doing audits and business advisory services, and also got me thinking about other things. And one of the things that I thought about was, do you want to be a business owner someday? Did someday you want to be, oh, I don't know, maybe in the position that I'm in today? And uh, that influenced me um, to be receptive to opportunities. And I was out on firm business. Uh, it was a program called the Entrepreneur of the Year program, sponsored at that time by Ernst and, uh, Ernst and Young, uh, Inc. Magazine, and Merrill Lynch. And uh, I was interviewing the CEO of a tech company who was devoid of a CFO. Uh, he started working on me, and three or four months later, I was the new CFO of that company. And uh, it was a great move, although I had a little bit of consternation uh, at first, uh, because I went from this highly starched environment uh, with uh, a collegial atmosphere to uh, essentially a, an environment that had a very um, uh, large uh, cross-section of society uh, in the professional world, and um, not everybody was ready for that. So any event, it turned out to be, be a really good move for me. Uh, I was able to absorb that company in a short, short time span uh, and spent the year as a CFO and then became the general manager of the business. Uh, three years later, essentially led uh, the divestiture of that business and retired the two principal owners. I went on to transition the business, uh, which was uh, sold to a Carlisle-based plat plat platform. Carlisle is one of the preeminent private equity firms uh, in the marketplace. And uh, that really uh, was another launch pad for me. So uh, we moved the business to a, another larger platform. Uh, I continued to, um, to uh, grow that business and we sold the business uh, to North of Grumman where I did it again. So it was kind of a version, you know, 3.0 at that point. And uh, all along the way, a 10 year cycle, uh, the platform has grown from 20 million to a billion dollars. And so uh, I got to the end of that 10 year period and I felt like, you know, I've done what I needed to do here. It was time to think about the next thing. And uh, I took some time off, uh, basically a year, uh, thinking about that and uh, thinking about what I want to do next. And that, that bug about starting a business or owning my own business was, was deeply embedded in me. And, and so I started to, uh, to really start to press those buttons. And the tech space was moving so fast that I thought that's gonna take too long. I had a bunch of uh, opportunities presented to me and one was uh, via a competitor. Uh, they thought that I could help them grow their business and uh, we knew each other in the marketplace. And so I decided to do that. Um, I stood up what is essentially Ironbow Technologies today in that platform, but I will tell you it was the the most miserable first three years of my life. Uh, the legacy uh, executives were not of the same mindset, um, culture, uh, and philosoph philosophically, we were in different places. Uh, and it took, it took me three years to transition uh, them out of the business. And uh, we, of course, I, I went because we were bringing private equity uh, to, uh, to the platform in the form of New Mountain Capital. And uh, ultimately, uh, we were able to move this business forward. And so what came out of that was uh, two businesses. Uh, we split the company. Uh, we put one on the market. We sold that business um, to a company called URS, which has now um, been acquired by uh, Amco. And it's a $20 billion entity. And I led a team to do a management buyout of the Iron Bow platform. And so as we sit here today, uh, uh, I'm just beyond 17 years uh, in, in this engagement and it couldn't have gone better, uh, quite frankly. Uh, so we did the management buyout in 2011 and uh, with essentially sweat equity and, uh, and, and a lot of debt. Uh, gambled on ourselves, uh, quite frankly. So I talked about investing in yourself and um, we were able to grow the business uh, considerably. Uh, we started to attract interest 
uh, over that period of time. And we had positioned ourselves well. We wanted to do some acquisitions, but uh, we did not have a lot of capital laying around to, to do acquisitions. And so we brought in a financial partner and having now uh, three experiences in private equity, that seemed like the best route to go because none of us were, were looking to get out of the business or to retire, but we wanted to accelerate our growth. And so organically, we've grown this business to a billion dollars. Uh, we're looking to grow it to a multi-billion dollar platform. How could we do that? And uh, we, we struck an arrangement with HIG Capital, which took me and my team from the ownership, uh, majority owners uh, to a minority ownership position. Uh, and, uh, and it's working, working very well. So I call our people team members. We've got 850, uh, team members, uh, around the business. We've got a half a dozen offices, uh, from the headquarters here all the way, uh, to Oahu, uh, Hawaii. We do a lot of business in the Pacific Rim there. And effectively we are a technology solutions and managed services organization, um, focused on network infrastructure, data center, uh, cybersecurity, uh, end user devices, and uh, collaboration. So we do a bunch of business in the, in the video space. Uh, and quite frankly, 10 years ago, what you guys are seeing now from a video perspective, uh, we've been doing for over a decade and we've been selling technology, uh, similar technology for two decades. Um, but we're completely video enabled. So our entire uh, office infrastructure is uh, hardwired, hardwired for video. Uh, I have separate video systems. I have integrated video systems. I have mobile video uh, that uh, you know, I can do on my uh, cell phone or iPad or, or the laptop. And we're based on a Cisco platform. Uh, and uh, today you would call that WebEx. Um, uh, principally, but there's some other uh, other elements around that. So it's how we run our company, quite frankly. And so when the pandemic hit, uh, we already had about a quarter of the workforce that was working remotely, and that principally meant at home. Uh, others were in the office or in a customer site, and um, but we were engaging in this way. Overnight, uh, we went from a quarter of the workforce to 90 couple percent uh working remotely uh, and uh the only folks that weren't working remotely are folks that are working uh supporting our telehealth business where we do what i'm gonna call assembly and light manufacturing uh and that is uh the next element i wanted to talk about because it's it's uh it's really a critical element that is uh, uh reflective of our growth and demonstrating um, significant growth into the field, into the future. So, I I talked about the base platform and uh, the things that we're focused on. Well, a decade ago, uh, and this speaks to entrepreneurship and everything I've been talking about thus far is about being entrepreneurial, uh, quite frankly. And uh, this speaks to entrepreneurship. So, uh, we um, we started to develop a, a, a pilot with uh, the veterans. Uh, affairs uh, organization and their uh, objective a decade ago was to figure out how to extend health care out to the veteran. Uh, many of our veterans live in rural uh, situations. Um, they have uh, many health challenges. Quite frankly, the uh, veteran um, affairs and the hospital system is overwhelmed. And so they were, quite frankly, ahead of the game ahead of commercial health care and ahead of the world uh, when it comes to, uh, to virtual care. And uh, we had a very astute account manager who took our technology expertise, married it up with our collaboration expertise, and started to develop this, this pilot and started to bring in other resources to make it happen. Ultimately, we, we built a, a uh, virtual care program for the VA and we are the developers and the purveyors and the managers of the largest uh, telehealth system in the world, uh, most comprehensive, most virtual uh, consultations done. I think they're in excess of 8 million or something like that now. Uh, and it's telehealth 
what I call not telehealth, that soft telehealth that you do on your iPhone, but this is telehealth with, with uh, practical uh, applications. So we actually build uh, solutions um, whereby a provider, a physician, uh, can treat a patient remotely at one of the VA clinics, let's just say, with the facilitator on the other end. And uh, the technology is as good as being face-to-face -face or in person uh, with that patient. And this has really allowed the, the VA uh, to extend their healthcare out and to refine their organization and to become uh, just more effective and more efficient and save lives, quite frankly. Um, when the pandemic hit, uh, it became even a larger problem for them. And fortunately, uh, we co-developed a, a, a solution about three years ago uh, in the form of a tablet uh, that could be dispensed to, um, to a veteran. And they can remotely, they can check uh, all key vitals and glucose and um, you know, blood pressure, those, those type, types of things uh, without having the patient lie to them. And that happens on a quite frequent, frequent basis. And uh, so it's nothing like being able to check up on your patient daily as opposed to, I'll see you in six months, I'll see you in a year. So much can go wrong. And uh, it's really changed healthcare. That has, that has evolved uh, for us. And six years ago, we started a commercial healthcare practice and that led us to building our own solutions. So not just partnering with companies, but actually building our own solutions. I used to tell the team, I said, we don't build anything. We just make things work, make things uh, better. Um, the Cisco's of the world and Hewlett Packard's and Dell's, they all manufacture stuff. We, we make it work. Well, it's no longer the, tr the case. We now build stuff and, and we're highly recognized for it. So, um, and then finally, if you hadn't picked up on this, we are a large uh, federal government uh, uh, contractor. About 80% of our revenues uh, come through uh, the DOD and civilian uh, agencies. Civilian agencies are like Social Security or State Department or um, the Internal Revenue Service. And, uh, and then the other 20% is made up of uh, SLED, so state, local, and education. Uh, commercial businesses uh, like Ironbow, for example, uh, and commercial commercial healthcare. So that profile that I just laid out, any one of you, if you so desire, can be a Renee Levine. You can do this, and uh, this all started. This all started at LMU, and me making a decision that I was going to major in accounting and uh, what I was going to do to uh, to make that effective for me. And then uh, essentially taking it, taking it from there. So the title, um, uh, Ethics and Integrity, right? So building a career on it. So I can firmly tell you that my career and everything that we just discussed could not be possible without strict adherence to ethics, governance, and compliance. Your name and your reputation uh, precede you uh, in the marketplace. And um, I run into many folks um, that, you know, you don't want to do business with them. Uh, if you don't have to do business with them, you just go on about your business, so to speak. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's a messy world out there, quite frankly. And ethics is critical. I can recall being in an audit class um, as a senior and us going over ethics in, in uh a chapter or two, whatever it was. I don't remember it that cleanly. Um, but I'm a bit bored by it and thinking, why do we actually have to talk about this? Why is it that we have to talk about doing the right thing and um, you know, conduct and behavior and, and that sort of thing? Doesn't everyone, okay, don't they do the right thing? And when you get in business, you find out that the answer is a resoundingly no. Um, not everyone is on the same page with you. And uh, for a number of reasons, and a lot of it's financially driven, of course, um, but that's, that's I, didn't, I wasn't gonna be a part of anything like that. And uh, so uh, when I talk about uh, my experiences and really I look at it like I've had three employment situations. So Ernst & Young for a decade, 
a decade with uh, the first run that I told you and, and now 17 years, uh, the Iron Bow uh, uh, platform. You know, uh, integrity's always been at the forefront of our core values um, with trust and, 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 and uh, handling ourselves in an ethical manner. And one of the greatest compliments that, um, that I think you, you can get is you, um, from a competitor of ours, uh, remark that, you know what, you guys have always done it the right way. Uh, you guys always do what you say you're going to do. You live up to your commitments and uh, you take responsibility and accountability. So, um, so that is worth its weight in gold when you get that from a, from a competitor. Um, this is a snapshot of the, our intranet. So the Iron Boat intranet, which uh, for all intent purposes for you guys is the employee portal. And so no external access uh, to this, but this is where we house um, specific um, collateral material and data that we want to share uh, with employees. And as you can see, it's, it's quite built out. I positioned this so that you would see the snapshot of our ethics uh, page here and then supporting elements uh, to the ethics uh, page. So you can see on the left-hand side message from from the president and CEO, uh, our code of uh, ethics, conduct, and responsibility, uh, compliance organization chart or, or chart, uh, compliance uh, contacts, and uh, our uh, program policies, and then uh, our program training documents. Yes, training documents. So, uh, what we've captured here is you know a message from me about how we're going to conduct ourselves, what integrity means. Uh, fair dealings. Um, the handbook goes into exhaustive details, about 21 pages, about conflict of interest, bribes, kickbacks, uh, procurement integrity, and, and the like. And uh, we actually put together an independent uh, compliance committee, uh, folks that have uh, backgrounds that would be um, Good, good candidates for that. So legal backgrounds, contact, contractual backgrounds, and accounting backgrounds, um, such that uh, there's a committee for folks to go to if they have an ethical concern uh, that they've identified or believe to exist in the company. And notice that I'm not at the head of that. Um, for example, I could be the reason for an ethical concern. There should be a mechanism uh, to, to get that reported. And, uh, and so there's a direct line uh, with the Ethics and Compliance Committee uh, to, to the Board of Directors where I'm not the chair anymore of the Board of Directors. Um, uh, HIG has the chair position, although I serve on the, on the Board of Directors along with my CFO. So we, we take this seriously and I want you guys to take this seriously. I'm gonna share some, some experiences that I've had. We have all of our employees uh, certify uh, that they've gone through the materials and that they've taken the training annually. And uh, when you're in the business that we're in, and particularly dealing with, uh, with the federal government, as they say where I come from, uh, they don't play. So when something goes wrong and uh, there's um, criminal or some civil uh, matter that needs to be investigated, you don't want to be on the other side of the federal government because that bucket is unlimited and uh, they won't stop until they get to, to the end. I've seen it multiple times. So this is um, maybe the most interesting part of this. And I could probably write a book, uh, quite frankly, if, uh, if, if uh, someone wanted to do so. Um, I think in general, people start off wanting to do the right thing, but greed gets the best of them it, it, at the end of the day. So I, I outlined four experiences here. Uh, I could do a dozen, but I didn't think I had time for a dozen. Um, but these I have personal experience with, personal touch. So this is not a story about that I read. These are scenarios that I know of uh, personally. And so a DOD workstations project back in the 90s, uh, two account executives, uh, one in his 30s and one in his 40s, uh, were uh, principally in charge of a, of a government program. 
And in the 90s, you guys wouldn't know too much about this, but in the 90s, there were still white box development. So today, if you have a laptop or, or a desktop, it's probably a Dell or, or an HP. Maybe it's a Lenovo, um, maybe maybe at a Microsoft, uh, Microsoft tablet, iPad, something, something like that, right? Um, but then there are white box manufacturers. And, uh, uh, and in the 90s, uh, there was a good opportunity for that. So in any event, uh, we had such a contract. And um, uh, those two account executives got a little bit off track and uh, bargained for some influence. And believe it or not, um, white box manufacturer um, put, a, uh, put a financial benefit in front of them. And uh, at the end of the day, it was discovered. Um, those two individuals were found, found guilty. Uh, and the youngest one in his 30s, newly married, um, uh, two young kids, I think at the time, four and two, three and one, something in that neighborhood, uh, not only had restitution, but then had to serve, had to serve time, and uh, did that for about $50,000, and the other for thirty dollars or $40,000. Doesn't make any sense. No sense at all, right? So, if you think you're going to get away with it, you're probably not. The second item, zero to 500 in contracts for a small business. So I know an uh, individual and a company, and we did business together in, uh, in the 90s. This individual worked for uh, one of the manufacturers that, uh, that we had a significant partnership with, a uh, bright guy, and um, he... Uh, he, he went on to uh, join another company, uh, got into some situation, ended up suing that company uh, and got some payout for it. He took that payout and he launched his own business. And he was uh, a, uh, a small disadvantaged business. He was a hub zone and uh, he put his wife in the business um, as a majority owner uh, and they were then a woman owned business. So he was covering all the angles for preferential contracting. Well, his business wasn't doing that well and he was just kind of bumping along. Uh, ultimately, uh, he and a contracting officer conspired uh, for him to win some contracts. And overnight, this company went from, and I'm gonna say a million dollars, let's just say in revenue, um, after being in business for some years, to winning over $500 million of contracts, um, some four contracts, uh, significant dollar values. Um, one was um, they beat us on uh, that we had for 14 years. And so that was an unlikely thing, but it happened. Uh, and uh, it ultimately didn't pass the sniff test. And so they, there was a lot of uh, commotion. And I guess, you know, those people get a little bit arrogant uh, it's like, who's not going to notice, notice this when you're winning business that has tr traditionally gone uh, to a competitor that looks like this or one that looks like that or one that looks like another. In any event, uh, there was an investigation. Uh, individual had to go before Congress. Meanwhile, um, Department of Justice did their investigation and uh, they were able to pull the strings and put and dot the I's and pull it all together uh, to to, to, uh, to figure out there was collaboration and uh, between the two and it was inappropriate. Uh, they were in violation of procurement integrity uh, regulations and uh, the hammer came down, came down pretty hard. Um, it was a sad story in the end. Uh, this individual was so selfish uh, that uh, his wife and he became estranged and the wife was leveraged um, in the investigation. Uh, she knew nothing about the business, but was listed as uh, the CEO. And um, he ultimately uh, murdered her. Uh, and uh, was, was a sad story and a sad story in, in our community, uh, the tech community. So, you know, this is white collar business, quite frankly. And so um, any event, uh, a really, really uh, bad deal. Uh, a retired Navy uh, commander, uh, conflict of interest. So 
there was a retired Navy commander who was working for one company. Uh, he thought of a great idea that he would set up his own company and use that company as an intermediary, which is a complete uh, conflict of interest uh, to do so. When the process, uh, of course, enriching himself, uh, negotiating traffic on contracts, and uh, he too um, brought in co conspirators, essentially, uh, from the government. Um, he got two individuals in trouble, including himself. Uh, he had to pay back almost $10 million in restitution and serve time. And then the last one, um, uh, my, I put my accounting and auditing hat on for this, but uh, this happened to be a, a, a mergers and acquisition target uh, that we were pursuing. And uh, this is now a couple of years ago uh, at this juncture. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I use it every day uh, in my business. I, I feel like I'm the second best CFO in the company. My CFO is really good, but I'm the second best in the company. And um, it's, I, I'm able to gobble up data, uh, essentially, and uh, make assessments and analyze things that people are trying to figure out. Uh, I can do it on, on the fly, and it's because of my training. And so from an M&A perspective, you know, you get in the weeds of these organizations that you're, that you're looking at. And we had a hang up um, on um, one uh, transaction that they were, they were doing. And it took a couple of few months for them to start producing materials there. When I got the materials, um, something didn't make sense to me. And listen, I've been in this marketplace for 25 years. I know the players in the marketplace. I know uh, how it rolls, as they say. And something in there didn't, didn't smell right. Uh, and it had to do, one, with the profitability of the transaction. And it was a large transaction for the company. Uh, 20 some million dollars uh, uh, transaction, um, but the profitability in it was also uh, extraordinary. Uh, and then the third element was there was a vendor that I just wasn't familiar with. And so I started asking questions and the more questions I asked, you know, the more scrambling there was, I started pulling the strings and ultimately I determined that there was a fictitious vendor in the mix. Now, um, the CEO was involved in this, uh, as well as he had a conspirator outside uh, working for one of the tech companies that was his partner in crime on this. And so they had worked this out pretty well and they had, um, I don't know, been dipping into the well, so to speak, for four to five years uh, at that point in time. Anyhow, the shut, we shut down the, the, the transaction and um, we never got until two weeks ago um, the, the real truth. And, uh, as we suspected, um, there was theft, uh, and the CEO was involved. He was terminated. The CFO was terminated, whether she was involved or not. And the COO was also terminated. And I don't think that they, they were involved, but they should have had some idea, um, or should have raised their hand and, uh, and it didn't occur. Um, and so, any event, that individual is paying or has paid restitution and I don't know what's going to happen to him, but there's always that person that thinks they're smarter than everybody else, right? And uh, ultimately, um, there's somebody smarter or you're going to, something's going to happen and loose ends are going to come about. So um, don't do it. That's what I have to say. Down the road, there may be some temptations. You say... <laughs> Mr. Levine, Renee said, don't do it. Nothing good's going to come of it. Um, don't ever do anything for the financial incentive, even taking, even taking a career opportunity. Um, if that's why you're doing it, um, you're not going to be satisfied in the end. Uh, I just want to touch on diversity inclusion. You know, it's become a popular topic um, because of all that we saw in 2020. Uh, and it shouldn't have had to come to that. Quite frankly, a lot of people didn't really understand it. I found in my company, uh, many folks didn't understand it because they had not had experiences that uh, would have opened their eyes to the kinds of things that, that may be happening out there to people of color. 
And so I shared personal experiences with them because I thought it would help them. And, uh, and, and it did. Um, but what I'd like to see from us, from us, from a society pr perspective, is that we evolve to a natural uh, diversity, not a metric-based diversity. Um, and obviously, it's the right thing to do. Um, but it's widely acclaimed. It's noted that the more diverse an organization is, and you can slice diversity in so many different ways, you know, like um, folks look at black folks, all black people aren't the same. All Latino people aren't the same. All white folks aren't the same, right? All Asian folks aren't the same. No, you can slice diversity so many different ways uh, and that the more diversity that you have, the better off you're gonna be uh, with your organization. I, we pay attention to diversity and I took a look at it um, with the C-suite and I said, you know, we're not doing enough and we need to make some adjustments in what we're doing. And, I, and as I looked across the organization, uh, we had a great uh, diverse um, population from a gender perspective. Some departments were super, um, where uh, females represented 70% of the, of the workforce and 30% male. Others uh, we were terrible at, where it was 90% um, male and 10% uh, female. And, you know, in some of the more technical areas, it's harder to find the females. And I hate losing females when, when that does occur. Um, but, you know, we got to work harder. You got to find them. You got to, you got to go where you're not looking uh, is, is how I described it. And, and so one of the things that we're doing is that we're putting a, a, a diverse diversity, um, equity and inclusion task force. Uh, well, really it's a committee, it's not a task force. Committee together that is a cross section of the company has a uh, representation uh, throughout the ranks um, so that we can get feedback and uh, we can implement that feedback. And so I'm happy that we are, we are moving in that direction and uh, just want to say that, you know, a more diverse society is, is a better one. Um, I've been using this for uh, a little over 20 years since it came out. And um, I call it the real truth, but uh, as you can read that, I don't need to read that for you, but uh, as you as you read that, uh, I was reading uh, Andy Grove's book, uh, who was the chairman of Intel, and it was uh, only the paranoid survive. And I think this is like on page six; it's stamped in my memory. But I was having great difficulty with the team post one of the sales that we did, and their biggest concern was, "Is my job safe?" You know, um, am I going to be okay? And in every which way that I could communicate, I was telling them, if you are driving value, first of all, we were acquired because people see value in us. Uh, if they didn't see value in us, they wouldn't have acquired us. That's number one. Number two, if you are driving value in your role, um, there's nothing for you to worry about. Well, I was having difficulty in any event. Uh, I host town halls and uh, I... I closed the meeting with this, and I've communicated this to, uh, over the years, uh, I have it framed in my office, um, and uh, I, I live by it, quite frankly, and whenever I'm getting that always, woe is me uh, thing, um, I point to it, and, uh, and I tell folks, I said, you know, read that, okay, and implement it. Um, there's... Uh, there's, there's nothing more that I can do for you if you can't take ownership, okay, of yourself and, and your career. So uh, it's proven to, to, work, to work for me and to work out really well. In closing, um, these are not Renee's Ten Commandments or some, ten com some, some thing that I got posted around. But when I was putting this together, these are all things that I live by and all things that I... Um, that I will communicate. But when I was thinking about this audience, uh, I thought about, hey, this, this works for me, for you guys, right? So, you know, and, and I put them in an order that I think kind of evolves here, but, you know, it, it doesn't matter in, uh, where you start, right? It really doesn't. It really matters about where you're headed. 
And you guys are all at the same footprint right now. Uh, you're sitting in the same place, uh, quite frankly. And it's about what you're going to do um, tomorrow and going forward. And so, first of all, if you don't have a vision of what that looks like, you need to establish one. And um, in doing so, I mentioned this earlier, invest in yourself uh, daily. But you got to set goals and objectives, and you got to measure the progress. You don't set goals and objectives, then you're just kind of going through the motions, right? You don't know if you've achieved something or not achieved something. Talk to an athlete about getting better, right? You got to set goals and objectives. Otherwise, if you have no benchmarks, you don't know where you started, you don't know where you're at. You don't know if you're better or not better. So you go out there and you get whooped again, quite frankly, right? So I say identify opportunities. Sometimes opportunities are right there and, and, and people just walk right past them. Um, sometimes you have to create the opportunity. Sometimes you're just leveraging the opportunity. But you got to identify them first and then you got to, and then you got to put it in action, <clears throat> quite frankly. Find yourself some mentors, uh, seek guidance. And uh, I did that. I've done that throughout my career. And uh, I've done that um, with, with mentees. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, I need some water because um, I'm almost at an hour, <laughs> an hour straight. Um, <clears throat> so integrity matters. We talked about that. <clears throat> you get one reputation. That's it. You mess that reputation up, <clears throat> and um, it's hard to recapture, very difficult to recapture. So don't mess up the one. Humility is so important. Be humble. The minute that you get arrogant and get over your ski tips, you're going to get blindsided, and, uh, and you're going to get knocked off of those skis. So <clears throat> definitely remain uh, humble. Read, write, arithmetic. So this is for my accounting folks. A lot of people think it's, you know, it's uh, misaligned to think that <clears throat> you're a numbers person. You need to be more well-rounded than being a numbers person. You need to be able to write. You need to be able to speak. You need to be able to articulate. You need to be able to analyze, assess, and communicate it back. And um, a lot of people don't get that. And that's, that is career limiting. So I don't care what it is you plan to do. <clears throat> and public accounting certainly helped me uh, expand my platform. And it positioned me to be a general manager of a business, not just a CFO. Perfect your work, your, your work ethic. So that's generally inherent, but you can work on it. Um, there's a generation that I think has lost the work ethic, not interested in working hard. Well, that's going to be career limiting as well. And if that's what you want, that's, that's fine. But if you want more, you need to perfect that work ethic and put it into action. And then finally, I just say dream big. Um, don't let anybody uh, tell you that you can't do this or you can't do that because it can be done. And there are plenty of examples out there uh, that um, would speak to that, uh, quite frankly. Is it going to be hard? Absolutely. Are there going to be trials and, tri and tribulations along the way? Absolutely. Are there going to be things that I call speed bumps um, that people what may call mountains and valleys, but at the end of the day, you get through it, and it was just a speed bump. You've had it, you've had it so far in school. You had a big challenge. And all you, you, all you could see was getting, getting past it. And how are you going to get it done? And ultimately, you got through it. You got past it. You look back and you say, well, maybe it wasn't that tough. Um, and so with that, I'm going to bring this to a close, uh, Larry, and open it up for Q&A. Thanks so much, Renee. We're actually just about out of time. Uh, but keep in mind that we've got our, our student reception coming up. And I'm going to put that uh, Zoom link in there. So there were a few questions. One, a couple of them were from students. So I hope the students will join us. Uh, Renee, just an amazing presentation. I love it. Uh, I would have to say one of the best. And I've been having 
speakers in on ethics since 2006. And, you know, we have a, a CBA mission now, which, you know, you, you fit this so perfectly. And that mission is we advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. I would say your, your life and career fits that perfectly. So thank you so much for this.